All right, thank you for the introduction. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, yeah, my name is Ashley Edwards. I'm a research scientist at AI Labs, which is Uber's uh, core research division for doing um, research in artificial intelligence here. And so today I'm going to be talking about uh, some work that I did on learning values and policies from observation. So the world consists of a lot of data that will be really interesting and useful for training artificial agents to learn. For example, maybe you want to teach a robot how to walk by showing in a video of a dog walking down the street. Or maybe we want to teach an agent how to box by showing in a video game of people boxing. So typically when we want to train agents using these sorts of examples, we're going to use an approach known as imitation learning. And so in imitation learning, what you do is you have your states that you want to teach the agent and you have, uh, you're basically controlling um, the game here. And so what you're trying to say is when you're in this state, this is the action that you should take. When you're in this state, this is the action that you can take. But if we want to learn from things like videos, we typically don't have access to actions. And so what I'm going to talk about today is how we can learn from only imitation from observation, where we don't actually have access to our actions. We're learning directly from our states only. So this is useful when we're learning from things like videos. So there are a couple of different methods that have been used um, in the literature for training agents from um, videos alone. The first mechanism learns dynamics models in the agent's environment. So what it will do is say, okay, I'm going to walk around in the agent's environment. I'm going to figure out how the dynamics work. And then I'm going to use that model to predict which actions were taken in a video. Another thing that we can do is, again, learn reward functions. And now we're going to use those reward functions to train reinforcement learning agents. So the problem with both of these different approaches is that, is that they typically require a lot of data to learn. So during this talk, I'm going to talk about a couple of different, uh, more data efficient ways of learning from observation. And so in the first part of the talk, I'm going to talk about how we can learn value functions directly from observation. And then I'm going to talk about how we can learn policies. OK, so now I'm going to give like the world's briefest introduction to reinforcement learning. <laughs> I hope some of you are familiar with it. Um, so in reinforcement learning, you typically, typically have an agent, like something like a robot, interacting with, with its environment and taking actions and trying to maximize these things called rewards. So for example, if you have a robot that wants to walk to the end of the hallway, it might get a reward of one when it gets to the end. And what it's going to try to do is figure out which actions it should take in order to maximize the rewards that it receives. So in re reinforcement learning, what we're interested in something is something called the return, which is our long-term discounted reward over time. And so we want to figure out how we can take actions to maximize that return. So usually we'll estimate something called a value function. So what a value function is doing, it's saying, when I'm in a particular state, what is the long-term expected reward that I should get in that state? And the reason that we care about something like that is because we want to end up in states that have a high uh, long-term expected reward. Um, and so another thing that we're interested in estimating is a policy that just says, when I'm in a state, which action should I take? And what a policy should tell us is, how do I take actions that allow me to maximize my long-term reward? So in the first part of this talk, I'm going to explain how can we learn these values directly from observation. So again, how can I learn a value function now from my videos? And then I'll talk about how we can learn a policy directly from our videos without actually having to learn a value function. OK. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is how we can learn a value function. So if you think about when we're solving tasks, there's usually an order for how we want things to be accomplished. For example, if we're building a table, like from Ikea, it's usually better to have our pieces outside of the box than within the box. It's usually better to have our table constructed than having our pieces lying on the floor. So if you think about how we might uh, define a value function for this, we might say, OK, well, it's very valuable for my, my table to be constructed. So I'll, let's see, I'll give it a reward of one when I reach the end of this task. And then I might say, okay, well, this is a little, oh, sorry, I'm pointing at that. <laughs> this is a little bit worse um, than having uh, my table constructed, so I'm going to give it a little bit of a smaller value, and then so forth. So I can discount these things. So basically what this is saying is the closer I am to the goal, the larger my value is going to be, and the farther away that I get, the smaller my value is going to be. And this, again, is coming from our sum of rewards here, which is saying that my, my reward or my return is going to be uh, my discounted sum of rewards. So when I'm at the goal, that's going to be one, then it's going to be discounted, and so forth. So usually when we're learning from videos, or if we have a video showing us how to complete a task, we again get this sort of ordering that says, this is how things should be done. So if I'm going to show you something, well, you should get a reward of one when you, reach, or when you complete the task, and then I'm going to discount it when, you, when you're in the beginning of something like a video. 
Um, so that's basically what this approach is going to do. So I'm trying to figure out how can I assign values to reinforcement learning um, or to my videos. And then I'm going to use these values to train reinforcement learning agents. So let's say that I have a sequence of observations, again, coming from something like a video. So these are my states in the video. I can assign values to this video using, using the same approach that I just talked about before, which is I'm going to give it a value of one when I reach the end of the video. And then I'm going to discount that the further and further away I get from the start of the video. So basically what this is saying is, um, this here is the length of a trajectory that I have, so like the length of a video. This is my index in the video. So what this is basically saying is my value should be uh, a function of how far away I am from the, from the end of the task. So the way that we train this is, let's say we have a bunch of different demonstrations. Typically when you're doing imitation learning, you have demonstrations from humans and that sort of thing. So let's say I have a bunch of different videos. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sequence, or I'm going to um, sample a sequence of states from my demonstration set. Then what I can do is sample an index within that demonstration, so or an index of, um, within that video. And what I'm going to say is my value for that video or for that state should just, again, be my discounted distance to the end of the video. And I know this already because I actually have my ground truth uh, states from the video. And the, basically what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to learn a value function that enables me to predict um, this term here. And so what I can do is just train that using regular old um, gradient descent where I'm trying to predict a value function here. And I'm trying to move it closer to this ground truth value function or value that I've shown. Once we learn this, what we want to do is use these values to train reinforcement learning agents. So there's a couple of ways that we can use these uh, values. The first thing is to replace the bootstrap bootstrapping step in our typical reinforcement learning uh, Bellman update rule. So if you're unfamiliar with this, this is another thing that's just saying, how can I predict my long-term expected reward over time? But now it's saying, well, if I take this action here. Um, so one difficulty with training um, this function is that it's a function of itself, so it's defined recursively. Um, and so you're trying to make these estimates based off of your current estimates. Um, but it turns out this term here is actually equivalent to the value function. So what I can do is I can replace that and use my learned value function here. And now I'm not going to, be, I'm not going to have this bootstrapping step, which allows me to learn with a fixed target. Um, one other thing is that because I'm assuming that I get a reward of one at the end of the uh, trajectory, I actually have a sparse reward function. So this actually ends up being zero for everything except at the end of the trajectory. And so this is what my update ends up being. One other thing that I can do is I can use that reward um, or use that value function to replace my typical reward function and then just plug that into my, uh, my usual reinforcement learning update and use that to learn. So the, the first experiments that I'm going to talk about are just, can we actually use this approach to learn values for reinforcement learning um, or to just learn values? And then in the next part of my experiments, I'll show that these values can be used to train reinforcement learning agents. Um, and so in this first task, we have this agent here, so this blue object, trying to navigate to this green object. And so in this environment, um, and the size of this maze is randomly initialized as well as the different obstacles and that sort of thing. And what we're trying to show in these experiments is that if we train over a video showing me how to get to that goal, if I see a completely new environment, can I learn to predict the values for that environment? So this is a result. So you can see here, so this is a heat map showing what are the values that were learned. Um, and so basically you can see around the goal, we have a large value and the further and further away you get from the goal, um, you get a smaller value, which is exactly what we want our value functions to be doing. And in the next environments, what we're trying to show is that if we have videos of people pouring liquids into cups, so this, this environment has been used to train robots to pour liquids. Um, so basically what it does is it, it has different environments, like cluttered environments with different liquids and that sort of thing. And what we're trying to show is that if we have a completely unseen environment, after training over these environments here, are we able to actually predict what is the value of my pour? So basically as, as the more I pour, um, the larger my value should be. Um, so you see that here. So this is uh, what we tested on. And you can see as time goes on, so as we go further and further into the video, uh, my value goes up, which is, again, what we want to see. 
Um, and so now I'm going to actually talk about can we actually use these to train reinforcement learning agents. And so this environment here is something known as coin run, which is again another um, randomized environment where you have uh, an agent that has random colors, uh, random backgrounds, and the, the task is for it to reach the end of a platform game where it reaches a coin. Um, so again, we're going to test in unseen environments, but now we're going to try to see if we can use those values that we learned to train reinforcement learning agents. This is what the results look like. Um, so you can see here basically that uh, the agent is able to learn to reach the coin, and this graph is showing as the agent is learning, how much reward does it get over time? And we compare against a standard reward function where an agent just gets a reward of one for reaching the end of the platform, and you can see that our approach using both of those um, mechanisms for training re the reinforcement learning agent is able to learn more quickly than that standard reward function. So in summary, I've shown that values can be learned uh, directly from observation, and, and, that, and these values can be used to train reinforcement learning agents. But if you think about when we're solving tasks, if we watch somebody do something, we don't usually need to just learn how to do it ourselves completely from scratch, right? Usually, for example, if we're watching our friend play a video game, we might not know what the controls are, but we can figure out how to play the game. We can learn, okay, well, I need to jump over that, or I need to go in that door, or I need to avoid that uh, monster or whatever. Um, and then once we pick up a controller, what we can do is figure out how to map what we've learned to the controls that we can actually play in the game. Um, so this next work that I'm talking about, um, imitating latent policies from observation, uh, which is recent work that we published at ICML, um, is going to do exactly that. So what we're going to do is, given a video, again, like a sequence of observations, we're going to learn something called a latent policy. So we're just going to look at that video and try to figure out, how do I accomplish that task? I don't know what the actions are, but I know sort of what the actions look like. And then I'm going to take a few steps in my environment to try to align that policy or that latent policy to the real actions that I can take in the world. So what we're given is a sequence of observations, again, something like a video, um, and we are assuming that we have discrete actions. So we're going to define Z as something called a latent action that describes the kind of transition that can occur. For example, um, this can be something like uh, a real action that you can take or something like bumping into a wall, which might not be modeled by our actions, but it's a sort of transition that we can see. Um, so for example, if you have an agent in a state like this, um, a latent action might say, okay, well, I've seen this sort of movement in the world. I don't know what the name of it is, but I know that it looks different from this sort of movement. And so we want our latent actions to sort of try to predict these different kinds of movements that we've seen in the data. And so what we're defining a latent policy to be is the probability of taking one of these latent actions in some state. So how do we learn this latent policy? Well, we're going to use a neural network here. And so what we do is we take in our state and we have a generative model that tries to predict each of our next states given a latent action. So for example, if I'm in a, again in this state here, I want that to predict the moving right action, even though I don't know the name of it, but when I plug in this latent action, I want it to predict that I'm moving to the right. Or if I, put, uh, if I plug in a different latent action, I want it to predict that I'm moving up. So I'm trying to basically learn all of these different sorts of clusterings of how my transitions can occur. And then what I'm going to try to predict is the probability of taking one of these latent actions in a state. And that probability is basically what my policy is. So it's what my latent policy is. It's saying, what is the probability of me doing this thing that looks like I'm moving to the right, or me doing this thing that looks like I'm moving, um, jumping in the air, for example. And so the way that we train this is we're going to use, um, again, we have a neural network. And what we're going to do is try to make our predictions look more and more like the, the states that we've observed in the world. Because remember, we have video, so we have our state in our next state prediction. So when we plug our state into our generative model, Given a latent action, I want to see which of those predictions looks like the next state prediction or next state that I've actually observed in the world. I'm going to try to make that prediction look more like the one that I've observed. So this is basically trying to learn all of the different sorts of transitions that I can see. And then the way that I learn my policy is I'm going to hold that uh, those latent predictions fixed, and I'm going to try to predict the expected next state. So the expected next state is going to say, OK, well, let's say I'm in a platform game and I have the moving right uh, transition. I want that to have a high probability because I move to the right very often. And so this latent uh, policy here is going to multiply each of my transitions times the probability of it occurring. Um, and so what that's going to do is allow me to learn my policy. So that probability is, is directly what my latent policy is. And I'm going to train both of these using, um, again, gradient descent. All right, after that, what we need to do is align our uh, latent actions to the real actions that we can take in the world. 
So that's basically what this network is showing. What I need to do is relabel my real actions or my latent actions with the real actions that I can take. Uh, and the way that I train this is basically I use my real world experience in the world to uh, figure out how to relabel them. Um, so I'm going to actually skip this in for time purposes, but it's a bunch of math and stuff. <laughs> but basically, yeah, what we need to do is figure out how, to, how do we relabel our latent actions with the real ones. Once I learn that relabeling, um, I can just follow that relabeled policy to allow me to figure out which actions to take. All right, so we tried this out in, in a few different environments. The first one is cart pull, where an agent needs to learn to balance a pull. Um, the next one is this Acrobat environment where it has to like swing itself up. And then we have mountain car, where again, a, like a mountain car needs to swing itself up to the top of a mountain. Um, and we compare against an approach known as behavioral cloning from observation, um, which is one of those approaches that learns its dynamics in the environment. Um, so again, the problem with that is that it, it requires a lot of environment samples to actually learn those dynamics. So here are the results in those environments. So you can see here, so we're this purple, and they're this bluish kind of purple, but we're better than them in, this, in these graphs, basically. Um, so you can see, yeah, so this is cart pull, acrobat, and mountain car. Um, and we're able to learn more quickly if you look at the amount of environment interactions we require and the amount of reward that we're able to receive over time. So the next environment that we tried this out in is something called coin run, uh, where, again, I explained it as before, you have an agent trying to navigate to a coin. We tried it on these two different environments here. So again, you can see that we're able to do better than um, behavioral cloning from observation in uh, both of those environments. And one nice thing about our approach is that it actually enables us to learn some behavior zero shot, um, because again, we're learning our latent policy from our video, and then we're going to relabel it using the real world actions. But sometimes our, our uh, network will randomly initialize the latent actions to the correct actions that we can actually take in the world. Um, so you can see, well, if there was a video playing, but there's not, <laughs> you would see it actually able to uh, get okay performance on the zeroth step and solve the task on the 200th step. <laughs> Imagine here. <laughs> um, so yeah, so in conclusion, I've shown that values and policies can be uh, learned from observations alone and that these can be used to train agents to imitate. Um, so one thing that I'm really interested in that I haven't shown uh, or haven't actually done yet is uh, can we train agents to learn across environments? So like, can I use um, a video of a human to train a video uh, to train a robot how to perform a task? Um, but that's future work and it requires a lot more thoughts. <laughs> okay, so that's all. Thank you everyone.